Welcome everyone to uh, the Center for Innovations Innovation Lab closing showcase and symposium for our work in the 2022-23 edition of the Innovation Lab. So really delighted you can all join us and we're excited to share uh, a lot of what our participants have been up to over the past about four months. And to open us up, uh, I wanted to invite uh, Margie O'Driscoll, uh, the director of the Center of Inno for Innovation to open us up with some remarks. So Margie, I'll end the screen share and please go ahead. Good morning, I'm Margie O'Driscoll, and on behalf of the Center for Innovation's Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The mission of the Center is to reshape the architecture, engineering, and construction industry for a better tomorrow. So thank you all for joining us on this journey. As we begin, I will say the reminder we always begin with, please be sure to put yourself on mute so we don't have any sound interference throughout today's presentations. Uh, we'd also like to take a moment to express our gratitude to the many sponsors who make our work possible. Thank you so much. Before we get started with today's presentations, I'd like to tell you uh, about a couple of the Center for Innovation's current projects. First, next week we will open registration for a conference entitled Lean Design Meets Innovation that the Center for Innovation is co-producing with the P2SL Institute at UC Berkeley. This two and a half day event will take place in person on April 4 to 6. We'll be opening registration at, on February 1st. Be sure to sign up early because this in-person event will sell out fast. The other project we've been working on is based on a webinar we held last fall, a conversation with leaders of the Lean Institute Ukraine. During that webinar, we asked what we might do to help these courageous men and women charged with rebuilding during war, as well as planning for peace. They told us they wanted to come to the U.S. and see some of our innovative practices, and we took them at their word and began collaborating with the U.S. State Department, U.S. Commerce Department, and the Ukrainian consulate to plan a trip. So the Center for Innovation will host 10 high-level Ukrainian government official leaders from the Lean Institute Ukraine in June here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're developing a 10-day study trip to prepare these leaders for peace and reconstruction. Estimates of the reconstruction costs for the Ukraine are close to $1 trillion. If you are interested in participating and learning more about this effort, please reach out to me via the Contact Us link at the Center for Innovation website. We'll be talking more about this in the coming months. Now, for the event you've all been waiting for. Today, you'll be hear from some of the individuals and teams who accepted the challenge to participate in the 2022 Center for Innovation's Innovation Lab. We've asked today's participants to invite their parents and to join us. So if that describes you, thanks for being here. To get us started, I thought I'd ask Dean Reed, one of the founders of the Center for Innovation and a true visionary to say a few words. Following Dean, our amazing instructor and guide throughout this process, Vivek Rao will emcee the presentations. Take it away, Dean. <laughs> thanks, Margie. Um, the CFI uh, Innovation Lab was developed and is brilliantly taught by faculty of UC Berkeley's Haas School of um, Business, and especially for design and construction uh, professionals. This is um, unique. Um, and sadly, it's not available anywhere else that we know of. Uh, in this self-paced format um, that is so important for, for people working in design and construction uh, because they're trying to manage their two or three other jobs that they're doing. Um, and so uh, while this, well, we believe that while um, a problem, a uh, vexing problem and uh, curiosity are essential for innovation, um, we think that what is really critical is to understand um, design thinking and systems thinking, which is actually the purpose of um, uh, the, the, the course. Um, and as I said, um, we think this is critically important for innovation in the design construction industry, and that's why we're going to continue to, to offer this, this course and hope that um, uh, organizations in our industry take advantage of that. So thank you. Right. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Dean. And thank you, Margie, for those wonderful opening remarks. Um, before we transition over to the student work, I wanted to add a little bit more context about what you can expect to see um, in the next uh, in, over these next shares. So um, as Dean and Margie we, uh, mentioned, we've been working with these uh, participants for some time. I wanted to quickly share an overview agenda of what you can expect to see. And um, so we have here, uh, we're in the opening remarks. We're gonna move right into those presentations of about eight minutes each, and I'll queue up each one as we go. Uh, we'll circulate a, um, a, a, uh, this program in the chat in just a few moments when we get started. Um, I just wanna give a quick overview of some more details of what you can, uh, the program that'll inform what you're about to see. So as Dean uh, mentioned, this is really a, a deep dive into creative leadership in problem framing and problem solving. And our participants learned about and practiced skill sets, mindsets, and tool sets to frame and solve complex challenges that they face as leaders in the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. And so we really feel that the intersection of the tool sets, mindsets, and skill sets, uh, that intersection is really what drives innovation. Uh, that's what the research shows, and that's what we teach at the High School of Business. And it's been a delight to practice that um, with uh, this, this group of fantastic individuals. And as Dean mentioned, we tie together three threads, design innovation tools, systems thinking, and a project that's relevant to the participants, right? Uh, so everyone who participated in the program was tasked with as a condition for joining us and working with us for choosing a domain or an issue that they faced in their work to apply the content of the class towards. And so um, the folks have been uh, busy over the past couple of months juggling their full-time work at a really busy time of the year um, in the industry and uh, working remotely and independently, they have applied content from the course to their challenge over the course of about four self-paced months. So um, after a kickoff, we had um, you know, some remote asynchronous touch points through um, a content platform, and that leads us to our symposium today. And what you'll be hearing about in these presentations is very much a process narrative. So how the participants engaged with the tools of the class uh, what the challenge that they were um, you know, engaging and exploring was, how they understood and reframed that challenge over time, and then uh, you know, what, they, what, they, what insights emerged about how they might move forward towards that challenge. And uh, this is the governing framework for the class. It's drawn on research from the High School of Business around understanding innovation as a learning process. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and move through this. But for anyone who's interested, uh, myself, Margie, would be happy to talk more about this uh, framework and connect you with it. And lastly, I definitely want to give credit to the founders of, of the program alongside Margie, my colleagues, Sarah Beckman and Rachel Zombach, who really developed a lot of the content and background and piloted this program with Margie, I believe, uh, four years ago uh, to, to get it to the stage. Uh, to get it to the stage. And so um, thank you all for, uh, thank you to Sarah and Rachel for their work. And so with that, uh, we want to move right into the presentations. And um, I wanted to uh, really celebrate um, you know, everyone's work uh, as they move ahead through the program. Uh, we had a really fantastic group of individuals. And uh, we'll be hearing from six of them today um, as, we, as we move through uh, our, our work and these presentations. And so um, what we'll begin with is uh, the first presentation coming from Rex Donahue, representing the American Concrete Institute. And Rex's presentation is titled Pairing Founders with Funders in AEC. And Rex, before I hand it over to you, just wanted to give a quick um, shout out to the audience around, uh, we will have five minute presentations followed by about three minutes of Q&A. Really encourage you to drop um, questions in the chat um, as the presentation goes along, and then we'll try we'll surface uh, some of those for Rex to answer uh, at the end of the presentation. And of course, if we run out of time uh, in that three minutes for questions, there's going to be a longer kind of um, semi-structured roundtable at the end of the program, uh, at which time there, you know you may be able to ask that question, or you can certainly connect with the presenter after our presentations this morning. All right, so Rex, I'll turn it over to you for the screen share and uh, you'll take it away when you're ready. Okay, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to chat today. Uh, we'll start at the beginning of this position I'm in right now. In 2021, uh, the ACI Board of Direction created a new position. It's the Director of Innovative Concrete Technology. I was, the off I was offered that position and I took it on um, previous to that, I was the editor in chief of ACI's magazine, uh, Concrete International. Um, and before that, I'd had a number of uh, positions in research and uh, development, 
of marketing and structural design. Uh, the objectives of the job description were to attract and pair venture, it included uh, attracting and pairing venture capitalists um, with companies developing new products for the concrete industry. Well, I was also uh, given an objective of identifying disruptive technologies that uh, ACI should investigate. And, and though I have a, a relatively diverse uh, resume, I had no direct experience with venture capital, um, a little bit of experience with disruptive technologies. Uh, so I decided to take that as part of this project work uh, with the course. Uh, my initial perception with venture capital, especially in the construction area, was that uh, VC uh, venture capitalist managers tended to focus on uh, software technologies or sophomore software uh, platforms, largely because that was um, something that could get a rapid uh, and massive return in some cases. Um, so on that basis, I thought that there was a need to focus more on hard tech, which uh, would benefit the concrete industry. Uh, before we get into that uh, ecosystem of venture capital, a little bit of uh, discussion of the ACI uh, space. ACI comprises about uh, 30,000 members. We've got a staff of about 120 that help those members uh, in construction, um, material supply, university uh, to uh, use concrete to the best uh, ability that we're capable of. We've got about 2,000 members who uh, volunteer and share their time and expertise producing certification programs, educational programs, uh, as well as um, <laughs> well technical work such as ACI 318, which is the building code. So uh, we've got a very broad network of expertise, and so it seems appropriate that uh, we somehow compare that expertise with funders as well as founders within the, the uh, innovation uh, ecosphere. To begin the journey then, I chose to uh, start with a central question, how might we encourage more innovation funding in the construction sector? And I really, uh, laddering in, uh, in a web of abstraction, came up with the, uh, the basic hope that we could uh, somehow, how might we increase the innovation within the construction sector? I had a discussion with Vivek uh, in one of our office meetings and he suggested that was a little uh, too broad. So uh, laddering down, I settled back really on the, the original uh, objective that I had. How might we help innovators and funders, um, or actually how might we help innovators target their uh, innovations toward the, the right supporters and funders. <clears throat> and to get into that area, uh, we did the exploration or I did some explorations. This is a, a, an exploration of the venture capital problem space um, through the, um, uh, through causal loops, the causal loop diagram. This diagram shows the um, green rep, the, the green rep rectangles show enablers. Uh, the red circles or red ovals indicate uh, inhibitors, forces that might uh, undermine positive outcomes. The green rectangles indicate forces that might indicate uh, positive outcomes. So within the venture capital or any innovation, uh, area. The main loop here is going to be set by potential market size for the innovation, the potential profits, uh, team skills, and knowledge, and IP protection are linked to those potential profits. I've got another loop, uh, which is a, uh, a balancing loop, which it turns out that with more uh, exploration, I think is a mistake. Um, because it's really difficult to understand what a quality of the competing process is and the quality of the innovation. Uh, it's also difficult to quantify what industry innovation or inertia is. Um, and although industry inertia might start off 
as an inhibitor early in an innovation uh, process, it'll actually turn into a, a facilitator later on as that innovation becomes more adapted. So uh, the causal loop diagram needs more work, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's gonna be a, a useful tool um, to look at uh, in detail. Somehow I need to figure out how I'm going to quantify what the industry inertia is or how I could quantify the quality of the innovations and kind of wrap that in. Um, but this is an area for further research. Lastly, I looked at uh, the link between IP protection, team skills, competing processes and market size um, for uh, a startup. The green line here indicates uh, the process. Let's see. I said right at the beginning that I thought there was no uh, amount of VC capital out there focused on hard tech. Turns out I was wrong. After getting into the project in more detail, I found at least two dozen companies, venture capital firms, contractors, and foundations that are supporting hard tech research. So uh, just from that standpoint alone, it's been a great project. I'll conclude with that. Thank you. Right, excellent. Thank you, Rex, for sharing and for opening up our, our presentations today. Uh, if anyone does have a question for Rex, you can drop it in the chat. I didn't see any, so I'll go ahead and ask a quick one. Um, Rex, so this is really interesting, right? You know, you came in thinking that there was no, um, you know, frontier venture to capital supporting uh, AEC. You found about two dozen companies. Um, that kind of suggests that there's maybe an awareness gap um, in, you know, whether people are aware of, hey, I can get venture funding for um, you know, what I'm, this innovation I have in AEC. I'm wondering if, if that came up in your investigation or if you had any thoughts about that awareness or lack of awareness in this case. I have, and I've considered uh, either publishing articles about it or at least uh, making a presentation to the, uh, the ACI Foundation has a Concrete Innovation Council uh, that comprises about 20 industry, well, about a dozen industry members. Um, that's the place to start, at least discussions with them and, and make presentations on the topic. Um, I'm not sure how much, at least from my side, are aware of uh, what's out there for opportunity funding. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Rex, for that. And thank you again for sharing. Uh, We're going to move on to our next uh, presentation. And uh, this is going to come with uh, the uh, Folks representing Wallbridge, uh, this is Casey Vesely Schmidt, Eric Twig, Eric Ozog, Lashir Champion King, and John Jurowicz. And uh, their work is called Wallbridge SOS Connection Tool. And uh, today we'll be hearing from Casey and Eric, uh, who will talk us through their presentation. So, Casey and Eric, the floor is over to you. Uh, so, yes, our um, uh, we're titling it a Wallbridge SOS Connection Tool to Solve a Challenge. Um, our initial how might we question uh, was how might we connect to Wallbridge team members when a person has an unusual challenge arrive that they don't have firsthand experience to solve. That question kind of was born out of several different ones, which is how do we get answers to our teams faster? How do we solve problems faster? But also how do we increase engagement in the field, um, either with new team members or less experienced team members, but also how do we share knowledge and experience? Everyone talks about the, um, the loss of, of a generation in the coming years as they retire. How do we share that knowledge with other people within the organization? So as we did um, laddering up, laddering down, as we did interviews, um, we really did identify that the team said, yes, we need something that we can get answers to our problems faster. Um, and in the current state, people felt like they could really only reach out to people they already had established relationships with. So how did we remove that barrier? And so we reframe the question, how might we connect construction superintendents, which is our, our primary audience, when they have an unusual challenge arise and they don't have firsthand knowledge? And Eric, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Okay, so thank you. So good morning. Um, as we met, move through, you know, we tested out the, the risk assumptions. Will the superintendents get engaged? Will they offer to help again? If not, 
contacted after initial offering. So what we went through was we had to go through and, and from those interviews have a better understanding and create through um, the investigations and the risk analysis um, some solid ground and a better understanding. Uh, the, you know, the, the, one of the things, the, the minimum investment prototype, I, I'll say, was a great aspect to this training and how we put things together. Because as we did the interviews, our team was started jumping to some con conclusions and that was able to pull us back. And we started thinking about how could we do what we had to do and, and what we originally thought when we started, our mind started to evolve to a, a solution. We started thinking about, well, how can we do this at zero cost or how a minimal to zero cost? And maybe that's not the best solution at the time, but what could we use as a hypothetical beta test? And that's where we came up with potentially creating a large group text um, with a sample group that could reach out to each other and, and establish communication. Um, so what, what are the next steps for us? Um, what we've established is well, how do we communicate with everyone? Now we're you know, openly in here. We were originally just to understand where our heads were at. We were looking at there's a good software that we could tie into the corporation that could get everybody tied in together anonymously. We plan on going out and beta testing the lowest investment product, which would be the text group. And then from there, we're going to see how well the responses are from feedback of 12 superintendents. We would put a, a test subject where we'd say, help, I don't know how to solve X problem. And you know that portion and that way we execute that is what we're focused on. Now, the following step after that is what we have is board approval and the action plan. So we will present this to the board at Wallbridge. Um, the, the, the listing document bullet points here are what they essentially look for. They want it in, at the moment, an A3 format. But we've had considerations. We were going to present this in the format and the structure that we learned in this class with the idea and the attitude of potentially swaying away from an A3 format. But, you know, corporations are slow to change. So I'm going to make sure that uh, we follow what we have in place when we're going to propose potentially a change to this format. And then timing, costs, who's leading it. Um, all those are identifiers. Uh, unfortunately, I'm pretty sure that we, we, we as an I and Casey already know who's leading and who's implementing at this time. Okay, reflection. So the challenges, challenged by the process to diverge and converge multiple times after the team thought, thought through what we knew. So that goes back to uh, that once example of the lowest cost example. We had a lot of times where we were challenging ourselves with well, maybe this isn't the right solution to our problem. What other aspects, what other things do we have in place? We have an internet database that has lessons learned. Why, are, why isn't that good enough? Why are we proposing this? And that really did a good job of bringing us back and challenging ourselves to not just jump to the next conclusion because our mind was made up. Um, one of the successes was the interview guide and how we observe things. I, one of the things I personally had was we interviewed an individual and asked them, how do you seek your own solutions? Now, we interjected in the before in our presentation about uh, needing help and, and asking a limited amount of exposure people. The other person, he, inter he introduced, he looks at YouTube, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of civil solutions that are posted on YouTube that he looks through. Um, so we went through and, and that was a success because it not only reinforced the need for something like this, for, but it also doubled back to that diverge and converge where we challenged through, do we think a YouTube video is really a viable solution to help shore up? And, and the answer, quick answer is no, just so nobody walks away here saying Walbridge is using YouTube, but um, that was one. And, and then reflection, you know, the tools of process we utilized were excellent. We, we really enjoyed the journey. You know, there was a, the, the whole team of us working together. You know, we had that collaborative already, but this was a great way to make sure that our collaboration didn't seek a unanimous conclusion and walk away with it without continuously challenging ourselves. And, and then 
launching to a much more successful solution in the end, confident that we've left, you know, so to speak, no rock uncovered. Fantastic. All right, great. So thank you, uh, Eric and Casey for that presentation. Um, Margie, looks like you have a quick question. If you want to pose it to that group, uh, that'd be great. Um, so I wondered whether you were all in the same location or were you in different offices? We're all in the same location. Well, to, to clarify that a little bit, uh, we all at times work out of a corporate headquarters, but we did a lot of this remotely across board. Uh, one of the individuals uh, was, was pregnant and had a baby, so she did a lot remotely. And then, uh, you know, a couple others, were, we, we travel a lot. I have a lot of work I do throughout the United States. So there was a lot of us collaborating throughout the U.S., although each of us has a, an office, whether it's open or filled at the time, in the Metro Detroit area. Fantastic. All right, so thank you all for that. Um, in the interest of time, we are gonna move on. Lots of really rich points that we will revisit in our roundtable discussion at the end. So thank you folks from Wellbridge for sharing. Uh, we're next gonna move on to uh, Joe Lamb representing Smith Group. And uh, Joe's presentation is Representation Matters, bringing an EDS to design solutions. All right. Um... Yeah, so uh, thank you, Vivek. Uh, yeah, my name is Joseph Lamb. I'm with Smith Group. We're a multidisciplinary uh, design firm uh, with offices around the country. Uh, I'm based in our Phoenix office, and I'm an architect with a background in retail, commercial, and multifamily residential um, projects. Uh, I am part of our equity, diversity, and inclusion committee uh, in our firm. Yeah, you know, many firms have these, and I think in a lot of cases, you know, they focus on kind of internal matters, you know, whether human resources, you know, hiring practices, you know, you know company benefits, as well as perhaps, you know, corporate outreach and community service. Uh, but my interest here is, uh, is looking at a way to start bringing those uh, uh, EDI principles into our actual approach to architecture and design um, as part of our, uh, our actual work. Um, yeah, so yeah, I am a, a cis, cisgender, white, a gay male. Um, so I exist at a particular intersection of various identities across you know, race, gender, uh, class, um, sexuality, et cetera. Um, but that's just one intersection. So as a designer, I'm frequently asked to bring my experience and point of view to a design problem, but my limited personal experiences can cloud my ability to um, provide an adequate solution that would be beneficial to all potential end users of a project. Um, so if if I can engage with participants from myriad backgrounds and experiences throughout the throughout the um, stages of a project, then the final result could be more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Uh, so, but so how might we go about you know encouraging and reinforcing those EDI principles throughout the life cycle of a project? Um, so you know here uh, on the screen you can see. Uh, to admit, you've probably seen types of versions of these before where um, there are differences between equality and equity and you know, what you're providing and versus the experience you're providing. Um, and you know, just as a little aside, you may be familiar with the image on the right, you know, with uh, shows various uh, blindfolded individuals trying to identify what they're you know, experiencing by touch, you know, and you know, ex you know, coming up with different uh, solution you know, or different um, assumptions. You know, it's a wall, it's a fan, but they're all touching an elephant. Um, it suggests that you know, if we only focus on a small part of something that we can see, we can't understand the totality of what we're experiencing. Uh, but even in this, you know, just example of limited perspectives, you know, providing a different conclusion, all the people in in this uh, cartoon are rendered as white. So perhaps here's a better version. Uh, so as I started thinking about uh, integrating EDI into the design process, I started with a, a several questions for myself, which initiated my research. Um, first, like, is this an actual issue facing the AEC industry, or am I projecting my own, you know, uh, morals and beliefs onto the industry and thinking thinking about these issues? Presuming that it is in fact a real issue, you know, uh, perhaps I should create, you know, look to create an EDI framework that focuses on the design process, and that was actually one of my first. Um, Kind of approaches to this process. Um, how might I, you know, engage various participants in the design process to consider EDI issues as part of the design, uh, the life of a project? And then, you know, are there any EDI shortcomings inherent within the AEC industry that might create roadblocks to this effort? Um, so, in, in some of my interviews, you know, I came, I was speaking to various people, 
you know, and then, you know, sample quotations here on the screen suggest that, you know, these EDI issues, you know, are important to the industry and that the status quo has been lacking. You know, historically, the AEC industry is, has been an industry by and for white men. Uh, the first quotation here, um, you know, particularly references your know, restroom design as an example where history and repetition results in a seemingly new, neutral space, in this case, the restroom, that actually can reinforce binary assumptions about gender and does not understand that different restroom users may have different needs. Uh, for example, you know, most building codes require equal numbers of male and, fe and female designated restroom fixtures in a space, when usually for you know, myriad reasons, um, users of, you know, perhaps a female designated restrooms may require more time to use the space, which results in, you know, you know, longer lines and, you know, longer wait times in order to use the facilities. Uh, but given that, yeah, but, you know, this has not, you know, really been addressed because men historically have designed the buildings and codified those requirements into building codes. Uh, the second quotation was, you know, with a, a student researcher here at Arizona State who's focusing on uh, gender inclusive design and in her research about public parks as being a space where teenage girls as a particular demographic are largely ignored as a user group, um, you know, when young children start to age out of a park's typical like playground equipment, then the, then the activity spaces start to become largely coded as male spaces, whether it's skate parks or basketball courts. So, you know, teenage girls as a group often don't feel that the park has a space for them and thus don't use the facility. And, and, you know, and her findings and in other findings, the spaces that, you know, a, a teenage girl demographic may be most appeal, you know, find most appealing to use would be the swing sets, but those are often designated and designed for smaller children. So even those aren't really available to them. And so, you know, if you don't design a space for that group, you know, that they you know, find interesting, they're not going to use it. So you may as well be intentionally excluding them. You know, so as I said, I'd originally thought that I may seek to you know, use this process to start designing an EDI framework for the design process, perhaps a checklist of sorts. And um, But some further study research, you know, I discovered that there actually are a, a number of these types of frameworks that already exist uh, to integrate uh, design equity into the design process. And further, I thought that if I were to try to establish a set of EDI metrics for the design process, then that list would inherently have biases built into it you know, based on you know what I would consider important, you know, due to my per uh, particular points of view, regardless of how broad and inclusive I might try to be. Um, but you know, some of these examples include you know, for the these are some consensus-driven metrics generated with you know a variety of contributors, and um, you know, for example, LEAD has a new pilot credit for inclusive design, which you know can uh, help recognize the correlation between inclusive design and sustainable design. Uh, there's a new uh, pilot program certification process called SEAM, uh, which can assess project social uh, responsibility, social impact, uh, social justice and accountability. Um, and you know this uh, document, the Kelsey Housing Design Standards, which is a certification certification process to go above and beyond minimum accessibility standards, create more fully accessible and inclusive projects, uh, particularly around housing. Um, so given that these metrics already exist, I started to think about you know, the design process, you know, for a project and where in that framework are there opportunities to um, engage these EDI functions, you know, it bringing in the, you know, the project owner, project design team, end user, and the wider community, you know, where, where are the opportunities for the, for this to be overlaid and have the most impact, you know, how are the goals established in the project and measured throughout the life of a project and how are they, would they be evaluated um, after the fact for, uh, to be modified for the future. Uh, so going forward, it seems that, you know, the focus here is going to be, you know, uh, because, because of the long time frame for a project, it seems that the best hope would be to start identifying potential pilot projects to work on, identifying that uh, clients where, who might be um, receptive to this idea and understanding that, you know, certain metrics may be more suitable for certain types of projects. For example, uh, multifamily housing may be able to explore the more inclusive housing design above, you know, ADA requirements. Um, and also working with, you know, developing client relationships to, you know, find out people who are receptive to this, but also finding ways to kind of integrate this um, as a may, almost a means of best practice in the way that LEED is sustainable design is often used. Um, and finally, uh, uh, one of my big takeaways from the course was a previous example about a client asking a designer to design a bridge where historically we may first think of, okay, our first question would be, what kind of bridge do you need? 
but start to think back and say, well, maybe the better question is, why do you need a bridge and what are you trying to accomplish? And if we can start more of these questions with why, you know, then we can provide more uh, unique, appropriate, innovative solutions. And if we can ensure that more dessert, diverse and representative groups are at the table asking these questions throughout the process, then the innovative solution at the end can be more equitable and inclusive. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Joseph, for that. And we have time for one question. Um, maybe we'll go over to Angel for your uh, question in chat, if you wanted to expand on that. Sure. I, this is a, this is obviously a big thing and, and very obvious overseas. Um, you know, when you're having Westerners design a building for uh, a population that is local that might use facilities very, very different. It's important to understand how these cultures and subcultures will, will use big public spaces and buildings. So I just wanted to understand what are the specific things that Smith Group might be doing today to help them better understand the needs of the communities uh, for the facilities that they're designing. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm not, you know, in respect to your comment about, you know, for example, you know, facilities overseas, I'm not, uh, personally involved in any any of that type of work, I'm not sure exactly you know what our company may may do in terms of that work around the around the uh, across the globe. You know, we're a very large company, and I and I'm more, I'm in a you know small market there. Um, but I think you know may perhaps like many companies you know in the in recent years focusing on EDI, this is kind of a new endeavor for a lot of people. And for my focus, it's you know as we're starting to identify what are those uh, metrics that are available and how can we start trying to implement those. I'm, um, yeah, I, I don't know that we're necessarily at a point yet that we have any kind of um, framework already in mind for these type of works. And, and there may very well be examples of this and I'm just not familiar with them, but um, I think that's part of what I think would be my next steps is identifying, you know, what are the project types, you know, in whole or in part where these types of issues can be explored you know, who are the clients or community groups or, you know, that are receptive to this, um, where we can start exploring these. And um, again, you know, just like I said, you know, similar to the way that LEAD is now, you know, we used to be kind of fairly niche and is now almost, you know, kind of best practice, you know, is there a way for these EDI um, approaches to, you know, to take a similar route and start be become more standard in the approach, um, you know, from yeah. us? I would just say that, you know, overseas it's more obvious, right, because the cultures are, are more varied. Domestically, exactly. it's probably more subtle and, and nuanced, but it still exists, right? Just even the way that, you know, someone in the Midwest might use space versus someone in a really kind of urban environment, like in Manhattan, the way that they use and perceive space is just a little bit different. But those kinds of understandings are really helpful. So I appreciate what you're doing here. It's a, it's a big focus of mine. Um, and the folks that I've worked with on the design anthropology, anthropology side has helped to suss out the kinds of things that designers need to know in order to make good decisions about the facilities that they design. So you're in a good place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that was a, a key thing that, you know, just coming across here is that, you know, a lot of these resources and understandings are available. It's about, know, you know, getting those people to the table you know, because I don't know what I don't know, but you know that's okay. where reaching out to those communities, those you know these existing frameworks, is where we can start understanding what questions should be should we be asking. Yeah, thanks so much, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that question and Joseph for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we are going to move on to our next uh, share, and that's going to come from. Mark Cookling, also representing Smith Group, uh, with a presentation entitled "Shortening the Design and Construction Timeline." For science and technology tenant improvement projects. So I will pass it over to uh, you, uh, Mark. So take it away. All right. So uh, Mark Heckling, I'm a project manager at Smith Group, um, primarily in science and technology and healthcare. Um, so I was working with a, a developer on a large tenant improvement project, and it, it was a really cool space in, in a great location, a great building, and. One of the things that <clears throat> struck me was that they had a lot of tenants getting into the space and, and looking at it and they say, I love the location. I love, I absolutely um, could see my company here, but uh, as the conversation evolves and they learn about how long it's not only going to take to design the space, but to build it out and uh, until they move in, it's upwards of a whole year. So. Um, we were we were kind of thinking, okay, 
is there a way that we can help these developers lease their space? And uh, it, it th that started the web of it abstraction and laddering up and laddering down. And we click, quickly realized that in, in helping them do that, we had to decrease the length of time that the overall design and construction process takes. And in laddering up, we were, um, sorry, laddering down, we were looking at what's stopping us and what are those constraints? And I'll get to that in the next slides. Um, so first we had to come up with an interview plan we, I had to come up with an interview plan. Um, and it really involved talking to all of the stakeholders in, in that whole process continuum uh, from the design side all the way uh, through the tenants and, and city. So uh, I had the opportunity to interview architects, interior designers, um, engineers, mechanical, electrical, fire protection, um, contractors, especially those contractors that are in the pre-design. Um, so they're the ones engaging vendors and, and talking to equipment manufacturers on their lead times and how long it's going to take to actually construct a building within their workflow. Uh, another central interviewee was the developers. Um, they're, they're central to not only leasing, but, um, you know, engaging those contracts with tenants to, to get them in their space. Um, and lastly was the, the city officials and tenants. I, I didn't have the opportunity to interview any city officials um, or founders or, or new companies um, during, during my personal process, but Vivek was kind enough to introduce me to one of his colleagues. He was actually um, the CEO of um, Berkeley Biolabs and Focus Studios in San Francisco. Um, Vivek, fantastic connection. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, you can see here, we did a little word cloud on some of the key things that came up during my interviews and highlighting quotes um, as part of the whole design thinking process is just distilling down um, a, a lot of time that you have in interviews. So looking at your notes and, and seeing how you can reduce all of that feedback into common themes. Um, we, we had a, a, some really good feedback across the board, um, but it was pretty obvious when things came up, we started to reframe the problem. So instead of saying, how might we help develop, developers lease shelled office building space? It was, okay, how can we shorten the design and construction timeline? But within that, um, it was the same time I was reading this book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he tells the story of the British cycling coach, Dave Brailsford. He's, uh, I guess he's famous now, but one of his key things was the aggregation of marginal gains and looking at how can we make little improvements across an array of different decisions that we'll see could make a significant impact on the overall. So in picking apart each one of these common themes that we distilled from the interviews, um, we came down to improving the decision-making process, the amount of decisions, systems procurement, furniture procurement, equipment, fixtures and finishes procurement, and then on the contracting side, how could we shorten the length of time to not only get tenants to pre-lease, but get the contractor contracted so they could order equipment. Um, and then lastly was city process. Uh, some cities have expedited review times or um, different ways that you can set up AFPs or um, inspections and so forth. So my dad just moved into, he, he recently retired and he got a, a little retirement community, a semi-custom home. And he was telling me about the whole process when I was thinking about this, it, it clicked right away that it's really the same type of idea that um, looking at ideas to improve all of those elements that we had on the previous slide and limiting the amount of decisions, but you're kind of in this middle ground, right? It's not total spec move in ready, but how can we offer tenants the element of customization 
but the ability to move into a space quicker. And that's where the wheels started turning about, okay, what can we do to improve this process? So creating a, a menu for modular design components, um, maybe getting all of those systems and equipment established prior to the tenant actually coming into their space, it's already there. They can just do the finishing touch decisions, the um, different elements that they want within their space and little tweaks to the floor plan. Uh, next steps, future work. So we really wanna look at, at test fitting different options for this, explore the array of modular systems, maybe interview semi-custom home builders to see their processes and, and see um, more what that's all about on the residential side. And then working with a graphic designer to actually develop some creative menu of services and, and see how this could work out. Pencil the dollars. I, I didn't have a chance to um, dive in too hard to the math, but we think it has a lot of possibilities. Um, lastly, I, I'll add the, the design process. It, it seems easy, but when you dive into the tools, it's it's really hard work. And you know, sometimes you'll be on a tool thinking about it for 30, 40 minutes just on one question. Um, your kids make it seem easy when they always ask why, but when <laughs> you keep doing it with these things, but it, it gets ingrained in, in how you think and you think about it a lot um, all day long, I'd say. It, it's creeping into other elements of, the, of my work personally, where I can um, start using this on other ideas and, and having it become a, a, a tool in my quiver, so to speak. Um, and then there's that thinking versus doing. Actually, you know, not just thinking about it, but talking to people and and having that structure to um, to provide and aid in in talking and figuring things out. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation and those reflections there at the end. Um, in the interest of time, we're a little behind on on timing, so we're going to need to. Go ahead and move to the next presentation. I'd invite anyone to drop in questions for uh, Mark in the chat uh, that y'all can address either you know in the chat or offline. It's a great comment from Larry. Uh, so Larry, hopefully you and, and Mark can connect more to, to explore this. Um, and uh, you know, great comment from Angel as well in the chat. So, uh, but we do need to move on to our next presentation, which is going to be from Stacy Brenniger, representing Smith Group, uh, on passing the mic and knowledge transfer. Great. Okay, so um, I'm Stacy Brenniger. I'm also a Smith Group and I'm in our DC office and this is Passing the Mic. So uh, I thought at the beginning of this project, where should we begin? And it made me think about uh, a, a principal who once said to me, if you draw it for better or worse, it's likely gonna get built. And, and that sort of was my beginning point about thinking about um, sort of, I was thinking more about standards and processes and improving um, the design process. Um, in the in the A and E uh, discipline, and so I sort of think about this in terms of like which one do you want it to be when you start at the beginning? Are you wanting it to be the left or the right? Um, obviously, the left sometimes, unfortunately, still happens, but hoping that it's going to be the photo on the right. And I know that architects and engineers who um, walk into the building on the right still look at it and think about how they can improve it. Um, so, but thinking about that at the beginning, about where should we start? About um, you know, improving the design process or improving um, knowledge in the design process and, and, and how to get things right. So that made me think about how do we help designers select and utilize uh, various finishes and pictures more accurately during the beginning of the project. And throughout the laddering discussion, it became more about how do you increase staff knowledge and how do we get trusted experts in, you know, involved in the process and that in those early stages. And it made me think about a story of an uh, uh, architect uh, that I uh, used to sit with in our office sort of pre-pandemic. And um, he is usually somebody who's working more on getting work and developing client relationships as a, senior, as a senior person in the firm. But he was working specifically on kind of a sketch to help out work on an issue on a project. And he you know, handed it over to a younger architect and was gonna explain it. And she looked at him and said, this is like beautiful, this is a piece of artwork. And he kind of chuckled and said, you know, I used to do this for a living, you know? So it just sort of shows what the connection 
of you know sort of who's really senior and somebody who's not as senior to have that sort of interaction um, that is a quick moment but a really impactful moment to develop uh, trust and, and and engagement. So then throughout the interview process, I have some uh, quotes that I really liked from some of the interviews uh, that I did throughout the process, some pre-pandemic, some post-pandemic. And then also on the right is an image of sort of just understanding some of the stakeholder uh, connections and, and the various ways that folks sort of learn from each other. And so as I went through this process, I started to think more about how we transfer knowledge throughout an organization in a hybrid environment specifically. Um, the two interview quotes that I really like that are on this list, uh, the, the first one being the hybrid work is almost like needing to schedule creativity. And for creatives, that's a, that's a contradiction in terms, um, but it does indicate that in a hybrid environment, we really have to be careful and, and, and mindful about the time that we do spend together in person and virtually. Um, and then the second quote that I really like from this that kind of helped kind of unlock this idea a little bit um, that I'll get into is about um, somebody who's sort of pre-pandemic world who was a younger architect at the time and said, I was surrounded by incredible expertise and exposed to things I didn't even know about and talked about that part of her journey as a leader in the firm today really came from that sort of um, pivotal point in her career when she was exposed to somebody who, who really supported her and mentored her and who was an expert in their own right. So what does it mean um, to try to uh, create engagement in this way, um, and, and especially in a hybrid setting? I looked at various models that looked at things, you know, working with folks outside the firm, whether it's contractors or um, things of that nature. Um, and then I looked at, uh, sort of settled on looking at uh, how do you create a different level of engagement inside a firm for that knowledge transfer. And what really became apparent through the interview process and learning about different things um, and different ways people are working these days is that, you know, it really has to be intentional. And that has to be built into the firm, has to be built into the procedures. And you can't rely any longer on proximity of folks to one another uh, to be able to transfer knowledge. And so um, sort of the next part uh, of this sort of program to try to help engagement across um, sort of different cohorts of folks in the firm. Um, and this is, you know, scalable to other things is general knowledge transfer. How do you get folks um, who really know stuff and are really seasoned to be able to help mentor and impact other folks in a, in a knowledge based setting. Um, so identifying the testing groups um, that would be open to this and engaging also with new hires. Most of the folks that I spoke through uh, to this process and in this um, module setup were really more seasoned professionals and kind of hearing their backstories. Um, so understanding how folks struggle um, to come into new offices um, that are hybrid based and also um, junior staff who maybe haven't experienced a different kind of working environment. And so um, you really needed to understand that to define the, the, the parameters um, of, a, of a program. And then passing the mic implies amplifying voices, right? So understanding who you need to, who you really need to tap that you're gonna feel comfortable that's gonna really uh, start to sort of penetrate and transfer some of the knowledge in the firm um, in, a, in, a, in a broader way. So um, throughout this process, um, I started kind of in a place in like processes and standards and sort of a very technical way, like, oh, like, you should set things in place that are that are you know very specific and technical, and and that there's absolutely a place for that, and that's something that you know we have uh, to a great degree, and that's kind of when I started to migrate a little bit, going, am I on the right path here? And so it, one of the things that these exercises with the laddering up and down and, and getting the systems mapping going really helped me find where in the system I wanted to intervene, and knowing that leadership sort of always has to be engaged in this um, was always there in my mind. However, understanding like what part of it, what aspect uh, became a really important part of um, working through these issues. And then just a great benefit from this um, process was the finding different things about our organization I didn't know. And uh, it really also uh, helped me tap into some origin stories from some of the folks that are leaders in our firm um, and understood what sort of um, you know, impacted them and what was pivotal, pivotal to them um, in their growth and, and that helped them become the leaders that they are today. And that's uh, passing the mic. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Stacy, for that. Um, and uh, one thing, uh, one question that I had, uh, since we do have one minute here, is you know I, I love that how might we that you you zeroed in on and how you connected it to the idea of leaders with longevity. And I was wondering if you could speak a little more to what that means and 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 what came up for you as you um, as you were investigating that. I think that's really compelling and interesting. 
Yeah, I think um, one of the things that the, the modules kept sort of focusing on is that there's a human element to this. You can't, can't dismiss that, it's inherent. So any, any kind of solution has to, has to address those items. And um, as a Smith Group person, I know some others on the call, um, culture at Smith Group is a really big deal. And that people really, um, so far that I know, identify really well with the culture in Smith Group. And so, um, and a lot of them last, you know, I, I know people in the firm have been here for 40 years. And so um, the idea that like, that the culture of it is part of it. It's not just like getting buy-in from folks. Oh yeah, go implement a program or, do, you know, go do whatever. Um, but it's the idea that it, that it is also part of the culture, that it has to be ingrained in the folks who are here um, in order for people to really buy it. Um, and also leadership also in terms of buy-in, you've got to, people have to trust the people that you're putting in place to do it. Um, and I think that just goes to getting people um, to shift um, into, into new ways of working that's required to get people buy-in. Fantastic. Thank you, Stacey, for that. Excellent. All right. And so we will move on to our final presentation, uh, which will uh, be from Nick Tornas representing TECOM. And uh, the presentation is entitled Enhancing Healthcare Project decision uh, facilitation. So Nick, over to you. Uh, you can screen share when you're ready. Okay, so um, my name is Nick Turnus. I work with TCOM. We uh, are technology des uh, design and engineers, and I work specifically in healthcare facilities. And um, I'm currently in the Bay Area working on uh, UCSF, uh, new hospital at Parnassus Sites. Um, I have uh, worked on the hospital side, so um, coming into this project, I was uh, previously working at um, consulting with a healthcare IT department, helping them um, facilitate and move into a new, uh, activate and transition to a new uh, facility. And one of the issues that we ran into quite a bit was just being overloaded with uh, technology solutions from all the different stakeholders, all the different departments across a healthcare facility. So that was, that's what I focus on for my initial problem is how to, how to help uh, healthcare IT departments deal with this uh, influx and overload of um, technology solutions when they're trying to solve a problem or, uh, or improve a workflow. So um, yeah, the number of systems is growing year over year by just dramatically. Um, and quite often what we see is the vendor quotes that we received were not aligned. Um, there was, it was hard to parse out the costs, the labor, and then the ongoing maintenance. So it made for a very hard, uh, it made it very hard to compare apples to apples. So my, my theory, my, my thought was uh, coming into this was, what if we were uh, to organize decision-making requirements and data more effectively to help make better decisions? Um, the evolution of the problem though, as I started doing interviews and I interviewed um, architect GC, um, you know, IT departments from multiple hospitals at various levels, uh, CTO, engineering side, and owner's rep side. And, um, and as we were talking through how these, uh, how IT decisions come into play uh, for these, for um, uh, complex projects and, and, and complex facilities, it, it was, it, it's not a, uh, it turned out, which I kind of understood already, but uh, in a, in a larger sense now that, you know, the IT decision, the technology decision is really just a, a, a piece of a larger cross-functional um, decision that needs to be made among many different stakeholders. And that organizing the data and requirements is super important and not something that's currently done um, very well, but that the trust among stakeholders was really the most important thing uh, when, making, when making decisions on these complex projects. So it really kind of took it from a engineering focused data driven um, mindset that I had coming into it and and turned into this more kind of soft skills and building relationships and um, and deciding with empathy is kind of what I, I came up with because um, really understanding the person and their perspectives who you're working with and knowing that they're not doing they're not making their they're not holding their stance or making their decision based on you know, some nefarious concern or, or self-serving concern necessarily, but, um, you know, their vision for the project and for, um, you know, what they need and what their people need to do the job um, is, is really, really important. And it was very, uh, very apparent. It came up in literally every interview from all the different facets of um, and, and different roles. So I, I, I really latched onto that. And then as we're talking, um, you know, that kind of 
built into talking about project culture and how important the project culture is to the decision making process. So, you know, once you know, once you have the trust kind of starting to be built, you it really opens up for better accountability, um, better and uh, more innovation. People are feel a little more freer to to bring up ideas, and it, it really helps the project drive um, to ultimately better decisions. Now, this kind of shifted my my uh, my how might we to really focus on how might we help stakeholders in complex healthcare projects make more informed decisions. Um, and I realize that kind of backs out a little bit because it, it um, includes more stakeholders, um, but it also kind of focuses on the problem because everything is so interconnected on, on these projects. If you look at the, the healthcare project um, stakeholder map there, that's what I, I kind of came up with. Um, and I have a few different versions. This is actually the cleaned up version, if you can believe it. Um, just showing how how many interconnections there are, primary, secondary, and then you know once we get into the technical details of what everybody is sharing and needing from each other, I mean it, it's a very very complex uh, relationship. So um, looking at that, and then looking at how we build trust across that, um, at how we build trust, and then how we gather that data and make it available to everyone is is very important. Um, the other thing that came out of um, the interviews that that I did, and you know, just kind of hearing stories and uh, hearing project successes and hearing project failures, is really having that mission alignment across the project and across the decision making process. Which basically means when we're going into making a decision, regardless of if you get if you get what you want or you don't, you're still buying into it and you're still going with it. And that was super important for everyone to be able to, to um, understand, you know, where they fit in, how they, how the decisions being made, and that, you know, when this decision is made, it's it's for the best of the project, and 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 getting to the the ultimate goal is is really the most important thing. So one of the recommendations that we came up with was really putting team building into the budget, the initial project estimate and making sure that those activities go on throughout the project because you typically um, have a lot of project turnover and new, new teammates are brought in, they need to be brought up to speed and they need to build that trust as well. So what I did um, is kind of come up with some different ideas here. So I built a, a mock-up of a decision facilitation uh, software and um, put, really wanted to put the decision making uh, at the forefront of the project. So making the, the process to determine how, how the project is gonna make decisions into the project charter would be one of the, the, the top things. And then have that supported by a software solution or um, something that allow, a centralized system that allows us to track and implement project decisions. So we wanna be able to tell the story behind each decision. So that was another key Thing that we pull, I pulled out of all these different interviews was a decision is not just a decision. It's not an A3 and it's not a, a vendor quote. There's a whole story behind it. And telling that story is very important. So, you know, what you started with, how you got to where you're at, what those meeting minutes were <laughs> read, what the, what the reactions were in those meetings, if there was rank choice, if there's different, different variables there and different um, thoughts and opinions, it's really important to tell that story for um, for that, that transfer of knowledge, actually, which was the previous presentation was very uh, apt. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of crossover there and a lot of, um, you know, just thinking about how we're looking at this in the future, because when we turn over the project, we also want to make sure that the, the operational side understands why the decisions were made and what, what the, um, what the thoughts were and why, uh, why, um, we have the, uh, why we have the systems we do and the workflows we do to really operate the facility. Nick, uh, that is time. So we just need okay. to wrap it quickly. Great, no problem. So next steps, really just continue to work on uh, uh, interview people, interview different uh, stakeholders, dive deeper into different decision-making uh, methodologies. The other big takeaway here was like lean and um, choosing by advantages is great for the uh, AEC industry. It might not be great for the the owner side. So there has to be a, a blend there and a different matrix 
um, and a different type of decision making process to get um, to make sure the, the right decision is, uh, is ultimately made. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Nick, for that presentation. Um, in the interest of time, we will need to move on from that, but there's some great, uh, great discussion emerging in the chat. So we're going to transition now to uh, what we call a short roundtable, um, where we'll invite responses from all of our presenters, all, all, all from all six presentations. Uh, and we had a couple questions that we wanted to surface for you all, but then also hear from the audience. Uh, we probably have time for one or two open questions from the group, uh, you know, to kind of direct at, direct at the, the whole group of presenters that you heard today. Uh, I wanted to begin actually going off something that uh, Zygmunt had said in the comments. Uh, I'll just read your comment out, Zygmunt, uh, for the whole group in case anyone can't see it. Uh, one common thread I see in all the presentations is abstracting information and knowledge. Uh, from a business process methodology, what can go to strategy for the AEC industry? So this is a great question. I think you're absolutely right, Zygmunt. That was a theme that we heard across many presentations, as Nick just pointed out. You know, knowledge sharing and transfer uh, was a common thread. You know, um, between Stacy and, and Nick's presentation, and certainly there were heavy overlaps with um, you know some of the the opportunities that the Wallbridge team recognized. So I think what really is coming up in a lot of these these conversations and is is not unique in any way to AEC is this idea of uh, you know tacit or implicit knowledge that's you know experiential knowledge is gathered with you know making these decisions in the field uh, you know in the case of the superintendents at Wallbridge or that's accrued with you know decades of experience and understanding what types of finish works with what types of materials that can't be necessarily reduced to a simple heuristic and also isn't codified in a textbook and I think that is a challenge that continues to be a struggle. There's no kind of cut and paste business process methodology that I know of that can address how to move that ahead. There's interesting work and research going on around, you know, I saw there was a comment about AI, you know, using tools like knowledge graphs to try and capture that information and share it more widely. But all that is quite nascent. And I think I really want to bring it back to a point that Nick made in his presentation, which is the importance of culture and trust um, as being a really important mechanism to ensuring that that knowledge is uh, available and shareable right to individuals uh, across the organization until there are methodologies and processes to kind of make that make those uh, that that tacit knowledge more readily available i think it will continue to be a challenge and again this is not just for aec we see it in a lot of different sectors uh, that i work with as well so um Zygmunt, i think that's a great point and hopefully we'll be able to continue to discuss that uh, more deeply but on that note of culture and trust, you know, I wanted to um, start with one question for the whole group. And again, I'd invite our um, colleagues and, and participants in the audience, uh, feel free to drop in questions for the whole group. If we have time, we'll do our best to surface those. Uh, one of the themes of this program uh, since the beginning, and I think that really came through across all the presentations, is that you know, really wanna take time to understand people who are at the heart of the problem that you're trying to solve, while also understanding that complex system that surrounds them. Um, and, you know, one challenge is this that, um, and this goes to, to Nick's presentation as well, that the system is huge, right? There are a lot of people. And I'm curious if you all could reflect on how you balanced that and navigated that process of trying to understand the individual people, but also appreciate the whole system. And maybe to start off, um, maybe Stacy from Smith Group, if you wanted to lead off, and then uh, we'll go to some other folks uh, for any comments on that. Yeah, I think to your point about the fact that it's, you know, it's big and it's broad, um, that's kind of why I think it's something that um, needed to be sort of a baked in idea to something, that it's something that had to be innate um, as, as just something that, that is done somewhere. Um, when, it when it comes to sort of a, a way to transfer knowledge, it's sort of have, you know, finding ways to get everybody to be sort of all in on an idea. Um, so that it can be as effective as possible because when it does get, um, when there are lots of folks involved, um, things start to move and shake in other ways. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to be doing exactly the same thing, but um, understanding reasons behind it and why it needs to be done. Uh, somebody said to me half the time when we roll out new processes or new standards or new tools or new software, you know, half the work is, is marketing to tell people why it's important <laughs> and, and to get them to understand why it's really useful um, for them and that it could really sort of be game changers for them. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that, Stacey. And that really echoes a lot of what we heard across several presentations, that importance of that why. Curious if anyone else wanted to comment from the presenters on balancing the, the big system with the individual people and trying to understand both. From a healthcare perspective, um, my mentor always, always said that 
if you're making the, the decision um, with the patient in mind and the and increasing patient care, then you're always going to make the right decision. And I think that's kind of the common threat. You have to find the common thread that weaves between everything. So we may not like what Ashpa or HKI is doing in a project in terms of in terms of regulatory, but if it's with the the patient, um, you know, the, the best what's best for the patient in mind, or you know, if an architectural design doesn't work from a technology solution or or vice versa. You know, if if we come together and really understand like that common thread and, and kind of frame the problem or frame the the, um, the relationships around that, uh, at least in healthcare, that to me is really the way to to start to start every conversation or every hard conversation, especially like what are we doing to make it better for the patient? That, that's that's what we're trying to do here. We're help, we want to help people. We want to help them heal faster and better. Um, so that, that to me is finding that, that common thread is super important. Fantastic. Thank you, Nick. I think the transfer of knowledge, um, really applies to so many people. We started with a small, a very specific group. Um, but surely if you imagine if we develop this app that people can anonymously or with their names say, hey, I need help on a specific project. That can expound to pretty much every single department within our organization. So I think the we started with a group that could be most impacted first and then you have the ability to spread out from there. But I think it would have been overwhelming to try to create something like this for everyone it's much easier to start on a smaller scope, really define it, work out the bugs, figure out what works, and then be able to spread that throughout the enterprise. Yeah, fantastic comment. Thank you, Casey, for that. Um, so maybe to, to shift the conversation forward a little bit is, you know, I think um, everyone has spoke a little bit about their reflections on the tools. And uh, I'm delighted that many of you enjoyed using the tools and that they were successful. Um, but you know, we also heard about things like the A3 and that there's a way of doing business in the sector. And I'm curious if imagining you know, how you see these methods applying to your regular responsibilities, what kind of challenges did you face and could you envision facing, uh, facing you when you try to use them in practice? And, you know, how might you overcome them or how did you overcome them? And uh, why don't we go over to the Walbridge team, um, that's Casey again, and, and also Eric, if you wanted to kick us off with a comment there and we'll open it up to the other staff. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, Eric had to, had to step off, but um, I think that one of our questions and one of our high risk items was, okay, if we put this out to our superintendents, A, are they gonna respond? Are they going to provide feedback or say, hey, I can help you. I just did that on, a, on my last project. Um, but then also, um, if they do offer help and nobody takes them up on it, will they stop offering to help, right? So those are two main concerns is, would this be adapted by that specific group um, as a useful tool? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Casey, for that. We'd love to hear from anyone else who'd like to share, you know, any challenges you you encountered or you foresee encountering in using some of the methodologies from the program in your workplace and how you might overcome those. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll just add that, I mean, you have, these are additional tools that we add to our toolbox, right? And some are more suited to do individually with focused attention. And I think other tools are more suited to work with others and collaborate with. So it, it depends on the problem and what you're trying to solve, I think, but to make the best use of everyone's time and keep engagement, it depends on the problem and taking out the tool that applies best for it. Absolutely. And Mark, that is such an important comment, right? This, this is not as this program isn't a suggestion that these tools are appropriate for every task, right? And, and I love how you put it in your presentation and just now, this is adding to your toolkit as an AEC leader. Fantastic. Great. Um, so just a reminder to folks in the audience, if you do have a question, uh, we might have time for one or two. So feel free to drop those in the chat. We'll bring them up for the group. Um, I'll move on with one more that, uh, you know, 
we've been thinking about and talking about a lot. Um, so, you know, the R word, the recession uh, is in the air often, right? It's, it's a, you know, it's in the headlines and then it's not in the headlines. Um, but it's no secret that AEC, you know, like many sectors, is sensitive to those kinds of economic dynamics. And in such an environment, I'm curious what, you know, the participants, what do you see the role of innovation being in your work? Like, why, why does innovation matter now in, in, your, in your world and in your roles and responsibilities? Um, and we'd love to hear any comments or reflections on that. Uh, maybe, Mark, we'll go back to you to, to, to comment on that. We have to always be ready for different things, whether it's the market or different changes in the industry. Um, I think what I, th I think we're going to be in a period of extreme innovation, especially as you're seeing a lot of people in tech um, kind of transition to new endeavors. Um, the same could be said for architects that, you know, if if things dry up a little bit, they could be um, designers and software developers could could merge and create new ideas and new tools for us to um, kind of take the industry to new heights. Um, but on the operation project side, I, I think, yeah, it's it's looking at problems. And if if things change or or we sense that they are changing. Um, the biggest takeaway, I think, from this is in my interviews, every single person that I spoke with was really delighted to talk and offer their time. And when you facilitate that discussion about innovation, sometimes it's just the prompt. It gets it gets other people spinning um, and creating ideas and saying, well, how about this? Or how about I can connect you with so-and-so? And then you talk to that person and he says, great idea. How about you talk to my colleague or um, you know, it, it it kind of just starts with making the effort to talk to people about a problem and using this, using some of this structure to facilitate that. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark, for that. We'll love to hear from anyone else uh, among the presenters on that on that note around, you know, economic conditions, what it means for the industry and specifically for innovation therein. I'm, I'll, I'll uh, add a note that I think a big part also uh, what we talked a little bit also about sort of like the idea of tailoring and that because people are being a little bit more in, uh, particular with things like real estate and their size and you know what you know what really uh, is your bang for your buck these days um, and understanding that um, everybody is sort of wanting to make sure it works for them and you Mark you even talked about with yours like how can I make this sort of generic but also work for people so this idea that um, things things want need to be tailored even as you mentioned is it right for the patient there's this idea that there's a honing in on um on cultures and individualism but also group needs and and what does that mean and, and how can people address those in a way that is meaningful but that um sort of integrated into a system that doesn't take so much more extra time but that it can be just a a, a basis of the work fantastic that's my thought yeah thank you for that stacy joseph did you want to add um, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, I agree with that. And, you know, it's about, under, you know, understanding what questions we should be asking and, you know, some of those questions that, you know, need to be changing, you know, like, again, going, you know, as I touched on at, my, at the end of my presentation, that example of, you know, I want you to design me a bridge instead of what kind of bridge, well, like, well, why do you need it? And, you know, you know, that's, you know, that, you know, that is just an anecdote has been kind of like the biggest, you know, takeaway that I've had from this whole course is that, you know, you know, you know Maybe digging a little bit more into the why can lead to that innovation. It can, you know, in, in an area, you know, uh, in a time when you know perhaps you know dealing with shrinking real estate or shrinking investment and development because of recession, whatever. That's where you can start to rethink, you know, what is actually needed and find those opportunities for innovation and um, you know change and uh, you know creativity or or otherwise that uh, you know, can you know provide a client with maybe more uh, return on their investment, you know, when they might be, you know, sensitive to capital at least in the first place. But, um, you know, it, you know, just all goes back to, you know, you know, reframing the question, whether it's like, you know, how could we really get to the root of what the actual issue is? And that's where um, those new ideas can germinate. Yeah, fantastic. 
Uh, we have time for one more comment. Uh, Nick, did you want to share? Yeah, I was. I was just going to say. I think it. You know, it, if we're looking at healthcare again, healthcare, but uh, how might we, you know, generate more revenue um, in a in a harder economic time? Um, for example, looking at the touch points where where the most revenue is generated, you know, in procedures and you know, limiting stays and things like that. So looking at how to increase the the number of uh, to drive efficiency and, and increase the number of uh, of uh, revenue producing uh, you know acts at, or or uh, things at a hospital versus what can be done in that hybrid environment. So taking from you know building on the um, telehealth, building on different uh, different technologies to reduce the number of times you have to come to a, a, a hospital or come to a medical facility, and um, which really ultimately broadens your base and broadens your services. So having that innovation there and being able to, to hybridize and even you know, take it out to rural areas so people don't have to drive from you know, Cloverdale to UCSF, for example, you know, being able to do part of that at home and then you know, only having the, the minimal touch points, um, I, I think, is we're going to see a lot of that, a lot of uh, testing of those ideas, and a lot of um, you know trying to to bridge the gap between find that that happy medium between you know generating revenue and um, and saving time and and creating more efficiency and workflows and processes. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a great uh, yeah great high level reframe, and and love that answer, Nick, um, about you know envisioning what this means for healthcare. So folks, we are uh, out of time for our discussion. And so I just wanted to share a few kind of closing words here. First, you know, to our participants in the program, thank you so much for your work and for sharing. Um, you know, both Margie and I were talking, we said, you know, wow, we're not 100% sure, you know, what folks are gonna share. And the reason that is, is because as you all know, this was a really independent process, right? You took the tools, you learned the content, you applied it yourselves. And I think it uh, really illustrates, you know, what uh, the analogy that I love that Mark used, which is, you know, these tools are now in your toolkit. And as leaders in the AEC sector, as you move on in your careers, um, you know, I hope that you continue to draw on these tools and resources, uh, mindsets and skill sets that you've developed over the past several months and bring them to bear against the complex challenges that you all face in your work. Um, so really excited to see these outcomes and I hope we can continue the conversation together. We'd love to keep in touch about how this work is proceeding on these projects and other projects you encounter moving ahead. And for those, uh, those of you who joined us this morning, thank you so much for being here and sharing your time with us, your questions, your engagement. Um, I do hope that you will reach out to our presenters and uh, continue some of these conversations uh, and, and keep tabs on, on their, their work in the future and look forward to ways that uh, you can collaborate um, with this community moving ahead. And with that, I'll turn it over to Margie to close us up with some final remarks. Wonderful. Uh, Vivek, thank you for your amazing leadership of this program. It's been so much fun to work with you. And I think for all the participants, this, this mixture of design thinking and systems thinking is, is a rare opportunity. Most of you come with extreme expertise in one or the other area. So having to combine those ways of thinking, we hope will permanently shift how you do your work. And we think that's really quite amazing. So um, I'd also like to extend my incredible gratitude to all of you for sharing how it all went, what worked, what didn't work on this on this journey of innovation, because that's what innovation is about. We never we never get it out of the ballpark on the first try. It takes um, constant reinvention of our ideas to actually bring about the change that we all know needs to happen within this industry. So thank you for taking the risk. Thank you for trusting in the process. Uh, and thank you, Vivek, for your leadership, because I think um, this has been transformative for all of you, and we're we're really delighted. Um, if you have any comments or anything you'd like to share about the program with me offline, feel free uh, feel free to do that. Um, and we hope we hope this helps you in your careers as well as your companies on this long innovation journey. Uh, I do want to say that we are hoping Vivek will teach us uh, teach this uh, event again. Uh, we're going to be in conversation about doing that. We'll be announcing um, probably in April um, what the plans are for later this year, and we hope to launch in the fall. Uh, Vivek, you've been an amazing guide. We, we think of you as the, the guru of this process, if you will, which I hope you take with, with all the gratitude that we have for you um, in leading everyone on this journey. So um, thank you to all of you. Thanks for the moms and dads who hopefully joined us and maybe a couple of bosses. Um, please be in touch with us and thank you for your support of the Center for Innovation. We'll see you soon.